Hello everyone, welcome to episode 10 of the Kara Khan vs Everything series. In this series I play one 15 minute plus 10 second rapid game and try to explain my thought process while we play and regardless of whether I have the white pieces or the black pieces I go for a Kara Khan-esque setup. I'm well aware with the white pieces that it is by far not a great opening but the whole point is to just delve deeper into Kara Khan ideas because I can't play black every game obviously, that's not how chess.com matchmaking works and I will get banned if I have bought a ton of games. Real quick announcement, I have just started a membership thing on the channel where I'll be uploading exclusive member only videos. I actually just uploaded my first one at the time of recording. Um, but it'll be a bit more personal, a bit more like, I mean I don't edit my videos anyway, but a bit more raw. Um, I'll also be holding like specific polls so that members can decide which direction the channel takes, like series that they want to see. And also uh, members will be able to play against me as part of videos. I'm well aware that, you know, this isn't going to be popular with everybody. You can like normal um, just Centurion videos will not change whatsoever, but I just thought I'd make people aware of it. Anyway, with that being said, let's get into the game and I hope you enjoy the video. Alright, let's go. 1c3. We're against Fredishehu from Italy. And my opponent goes e5. Okay, e5. So we're going to get a normal Karo Khan type setup. And my opponent goes for the exchange and goes for d5. So this, I believe, basically is just a transposition. From um, d4, d5, c4, e6, takes, takes. It's basically just a queen's gambit declined. So that's quite interesting. I'm not going to lie. I don't know the ideas of the queen's gambit declined uh, whatsoever. I think knight c3 is a logical move. Knight f3 is probably good. Knight f3, uh, if bishop g4, I can go knight e5. So let's do that. I think development will be pretty natural. Um... My bishop probably wants to come to f4, I would guess. Like I said, I don't know really the main ideas of this. But if you think about it, this is kind of just a Karo Khan. So I can just play normal Karo Khan ideas. And this is one of the great things about doing this, because even if I'm unfamiliar in some of the positions, as long as I'm playing Karo Khan-esque moves, I should be okay. Like seeing this knight on c6 looks a bit wrong to me because normally this pawn wants to go to c6 or c5, which from the white side and a lot of Karo Khan exchange variations, that's where the pawn is supposed to go. So I can then look at this position and go, oh, this, this is a bit misplaced, this knight, because this pawn now can't move. It would have been probably better to go c5 and then knight c6, or maybe put the pawn on c6 and drop the knight to d7. This is not a major mistake, I just think it's a bit inaccurate. Anyway, we have knight f6. I'm going to go bishop g5. Then we are going to lock the pawn chain shut um, after we get our bishop out. Then we can develop this bishop. We can castle, maybe rook c1. a3 looks like a decent move. We can, we, we can just play very naturally. Um, if I go bishop d3, knight b4 is kind of annoying. So I might throw a3 in, which is always a useful move anyway. I mean, my opponent just threw a6 in because I assume he wants to stop bishop b5 and moves like knight e5, piling pressure on the knight. There was no real need, though. He could have just castled, and then after bishop b5, he could play bishop d7 or move the knight. But okay, let's go a3. I suppose rook c1 would have been good as well. Because then if bishop d3, knight b4, I could have retreated to b1 without blocking the rook. But a3 is a useful move regardless it's not the end of the world bishop g4 we could go bishop e2 we could also start with h3 which i think i'm gonna do just ask my opponent the question of whether he wants to trade or not i don't expect him to bishop e2 looks good because i break the pin bishop d3 is probably a bit more active but it's annoying like having my knight pinned by the bishop so I'm going to go to e2. I'm not planning on moving this knight anytime soon to offer a trade, but it is, an op it is a possibility that I could use in the future. And okay, I'll probably just castle, play moves like rook c1. 
My opponent might be going queenside, which seems suicidal with an open c file. My b pawn can move down the board very quickly. I have a lot of support on the b5 square for that. And he's created a hook on a6, so I can use it to force things open. He may well go kingside, but then again, if he was going kingside, why didn't he just castle on this move? To me, castling in basically all of these positions looks like the most natural move, so I think he's going to go queenside. So, I'm not going to castle yet, I'm going to go rook c1, because I'm expecting castle queenside, and I want to be ready with my rook on the c file to go b4, b5. I think this looks nice. Yeah, he goes h6. I think I'm just going to drop back to f4 rather than h4 because I'm going to attack the queen. And one of the advantages of having the pawn on a3 is the queen can't go to b4. So she's going to have to either sidestep or retreat somehow, which seems like a bit of a waste of time. My bishop's pretty good. If he goes bishop d6, you know, he's moved his bishop twice and he'll have moved his queen you know, up to d6, back to d7, and if I trade, the queen will have to take again. I think um, castling is a very simple move to play. There's not much need to spend a ton of time. Okay, my opponent does castle kingside, so kind of unexpected, to be honest, but I suppose his king wasn't under any actual threat, so he just took his time with it. And we have a game on our hands. We're a bit more active than my opponent, we have really nice control over e5. How do I push the advantage? <clears throat> Knight e5 is the first move that comes to mind. Just because I'm asking some questions. But I don't think I love it. The next move that comes to mind is knight to a4, trying to get into c5, and maybe supporting with a move like b4. Also opening my rook up to potentially expose the c7 pawn, which my bishop is also aiming at. And if he tries to trade the bishops off like this, then my knight will be pretty strong on the c5 square without the bishop being able to take it. So knight f4 is a nice move. Rook e1 is also very valid. It's just, you know, developing the rook, maybe preparing uh, e4 in the future. b4 is a valid move, but I don't like that you can challenge me with a5. So I think knight a4 is the move I'm looking at. Knight d4 with a discovery doesn't work because I take. And he can't try anything like c5 to deflect my queen because we just take. So knight a4, if he goes for a move like b6 to try and stop me getting into c5, everything here is way too weak. A move like queen c2. Oh, also, um, my queen just defends a4. So if knight takes, I can just take back with either of these. Um, anyway, so that's not a problem. Just escaped my mind for a second. Yeah, I think knight a4 is a good move. I like it. Knight a4, he could go knight e4 himself. Because I'm no longer defending that square. That's a little bit annoying. A little bit annoying. Maybe I go b4 then. And if a5, then knight c4. And the difference is if he takes, then I'll take back with the b pawn. And then I have a nice open b file to look at. Queen c2. Queen b3? Maybe? I ain't got b7. How does he defend that? He could go knight a5. Mm, yeah, knight a5 is annoying, because it attacks my queen and defends b7, and it's I can't really attack it either. So knight a4, knight e4, I know I'm spending a while in this position, but I think it's an important moment to try and get right. We go in, and we have takes takes. We do open up the D file. We have an advanced pawn on C5, which stifles his position a bit. But the C file gets closed. And I'd rather an open B file than an open D file, which would happen if we have B4 played first and I can take back with the B pawn. G4 is kind of tempting, but it looks too dangerous. 
like g4, bishop g6, knight to e5. But again, he could just trade and play c6, and he's he's fine. So let's go knight a4. Let's go knight a4. I think even if he plays knight to e4, which is kind of the move that I'm not in love with, then we're probably fine. We're probably fine. I was looking for some kind of tactic like rook c6, queen c6, knight e5, with like an attack on the queen and an attack on the bishop. But the problem is his bishop can always take with an attack on my queen. That would have been interesting though. Okay, now this looks a bit more tempting. Because he can't take with the knight as we fork him. So if he takes with the bishop... And he puts the knight... Well, he can't do that because then we'll take his bishop. So he'd have to take us first. Then maybe just tactics on the queen. Knight e5. Bishop e5. D e5. Bishop e2. Knight d7. Bishop d1. Knight f6. Pawn f6. Rook d1. I think we're up a piece. I think we might be up a piece. Or at least his pawn structure will be ruined. This feels like the correct idea to me. Like, okay, I didn't consider this first. What if I take the queen? Then he has to take my queen. Then I take his knight. And then pawn takes. If I... No, I can't take his bishop. If I take back. Takes, takes. Uh, it's okay. Here, here. I have to do this first. Takes, takes. If I take. 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 I have two rooks for a rook and two minor pieces. What if I just take back? If I take back, and he takes, and I take, and knight e4, knight c5, we have some nice positional pressure. Oh, he can take like that, though, which I don't know how I feel about. Okay, let's try and make knight d7 work. Knight d7. Bishop d1. I sh I'm sure I have to take on f6 first. Knight f6, pawn f6. Hmm. Bishop d6, bishop a4. What's the material count? I'm down a piece in that position. So the best I could do is get two pieces for a rook, which I don't want to do. There? Oh, I'm, this is really tough. There, there. There, there. Take, take, take. His pawn structure's kind of ruined. Hmm, I think I like that. I can play moves like knight c5 to try and expose b7. The c file is still weak. His kingside pawns are a mess. d4 is kind of weak, but it's protected by my rook on d1. I don't think I've missed anything. There, 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 there. And that should be okay. That should be okay. I just spent a full three minutes on that move, but it's an important move. Take with check. 
Yeah, the, the annoying bit is that my knight is under attack here, so I can't do anything like this, I don't think. Bishop takes bishop, bishop takes knight, takes, that's no good. So... Yeah, I, I, I should just take the bishop. I shouldn't be thinking so long. And it's equal material, but I feel like we have an edge. Because this pawn structure is very weak, and the queen side pawns look kind of mm, a bit fragile. Moves like knight c5 attacking b7, the might knight get the knight might get into d7 to go after squares like f6. Knight c5, does he have rookie two? Um rookie two B4, maybe B3. Wait, knight c5. Oh, come on now. Game, knight c5, rook e2, knight b7, rook b2, rook c6, rook b7, rook f6. That's good. Knight c5, rook e2 takes, takes. Mmm, can I retreat? Da, 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 da. Da, da. I could play rook dc1 to pile up pressure, and the pawn count would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 versus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But I have a lot of pressure in that endgame. Okay. I, I, I don't want to do this because my pawn hangs. I could go king f1. But then he has rook e4. And that's annoying. Rook f, king f1 obviously designed to control the e2 square. I could play a move like rook d2. But again, rook e4 is a bit of an issue. So I'm going to go knight c5. I think I can make this move pretty quickly, relatively, because the worst case scenario I still like. Okay, there are obviously tactics of taking and rook takes and rook c6, but then something like rook b2, rook f6, rook e2, mm, that feels really, really dangerous. Really dangerous. Um... What else can we do? We could start with b4. So then this is more of a threat. But if we go b4 and then we take, he has ideas of taking on b4 with a desperado. But then maybe we can take here. I don't know if we're just pinning ourselves there. There, 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 there. We could take on a6 and get a past a pawn. Rookie 2, we could go rook f1. But this feels insanely passive. At the end of the day, his rook is on a7. That's a horrible square. Like, that's just terrible. So we don't have to do anything drastic. We could just play a move like king f1. And what's he actually going to do? That's the question. His rook can't infiltrate then. We control all these squares on the E file. His knight can't really move. If the knight goes to like A5. Maybe we can just go. Mm, maybe B4 is good then. Because we take up the A5 square. B4 rookie 2. If takes 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 we're good. But if b4 rookie 2 takes and he takes on b4 first that i don't like that i don't like king f1 knight a5 we could just go b3 but then b6 b4 hmm this is really, really difficult, actually. 
the gun. I don't want to let his rook in. I don't want to let his rook in. Okay. Let's go king f1. I'll be really interested to see what the computer thinks and whether there was a more obvious move. That doesn't look correct, though. King g7 looks like the wrong idea. We could again go for this, but he still gets his rook to e2 because his other rook defends it. So let's start with b4. So this is actually a threat now. He might not realize this is a tactic. He might not realize that this exists, which would be great for us, obviously. Yeah, I don't think he does. Okay, knight b7. If he takes on b4... Yeah, it's still difficult, actually. He just always has this desperado. Um... Very frustrating, you know. And he's got constant pressure on d4 with the knight currently. Obviously, this is great for us, right? But here, here... I don't really want to take his knight. What if we go knight d8? And we're threatening moves like knight c6. I think we should take the plunge. I think we should take the plunge. If he plays a move like knight d4, this looks good for us. This looks good. Knight b4, I think the move I want to play is maybe knight a5? Because if he moves his knight somewhere, I don't even know where he would go. If he goes to a2, he's just getting trapped. So knight a5 looks pretty good to me. And then we're threatening knight c6 with a fork as well. Let's do it. Knight a2, rook c2. I don't see where he goes. And this is also a threat constantly. My opponent has spent like no time this game. It... I genuinely am so confused when people play rapid and literally don't think. Like, bro, if you if you want to play quick chess, cool, but play like Blitz or Bullet. <laughs> Why are you playing rapid if you're going to have more time than you started with? By the way, I'm drinking water. Um, it's I, I just like this glass because it's absolutely massive. Um, and yeah, I, I don't drink anyway, so... <laughs> Like, I don't drink alcohol, so it's it's not like straight vodka or something, if that's what any of you are thinking. C5. Okay, well, this just gives me a knight. I suppose I could take. He still has no actual escape. But, no, I'm just going to take the knight, because at the end of the day, if he takes back, then I still have knight C6, and we're completely winning. Because he's just going to lose an exchange, as well as being down a knight. Yeah, he's got these past pawns, but they shouldn't be an issue, because it's going to be two rooks versus one rook, and our king can get into the action quickly, so this should be fine. Okay, let's... We actually don't have to take yet. But I'm going to take, just to keep things simple. We could go rook c5, but I think rook a1 is cleaner. Because at the end of the day, even if we lose uh, some pawns, it doesn't matter. It does not matter in the slightest. Rook b1 threatens rook b4. So let's do it. Rook b4, a b4, and rook a7. This is just an easy defensive setup here. Because he can't keep the a pawn defended any other way, and he resigns. I have no idea why he spent absolutely no time. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't. But, very interesting game. We got, like, a Queen's Gambit. Like, I don't play the Queen's Gambit, but it was actually quite an interesting position. And to be fair, a lot of the same Karo ideas applied. I think one of the guys in the comment section, like, Nicholas or something, I think? Apologies if that's wrong. Mentioned that, as the white pieces, I should play the Queen's Gambit because... It gets very similar positions to the Karo. And honestly, I had no idea what he was on about. I was like, what? But seeing this game, I mean, it makes sense. Like, this looks like an exchange Karo just from the white side. 
because from the black side, let's just go back and exchange Caro looks like this. Takes, takes, and um, let's say knight to f3. Now, how different is this position? Let's flip the board. How different is this position to this position? It's just the e, the e and c pawns have been reversed. It's an exchange Caro, just with white. So, yeah, a lot of the same theory applies, which is quite interesting. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the game. I'd encourage you to stick around for the analysis. Let's get into it. All right, game analysis time. So the game review gives me 90% accuracy flat and my opponent 82.1. It was a pretty high level game to be fair. Like, I don't think either of us made any massive mistakes, but I think that queen d6 move from my opponent, uh, the computer agrees with me, in this position was not good. But many mistakes were made and it'll be interesting to see where the computer would have taken the game. Like I said before, bit of a disclaimer, I know that c3 is not really a valid opening. I mean, it's, it's valid, right? But if you want to push for an advantage, c3 is not the way to do it with the white pieces. As the black pieces, it's different because you're already a move down, or like half a move down, I suppose. So you're trying to equalize. Why would you want to equalize with white? You want to get an advantage. So like I say, I know it's not perfect at all but we get a Karo Khan-esque position and that's what this whole series is about. So we have c3, e5, d4, e, d, c, d and d5 and yeah this kind of just reverts into a queen's gambit declined structure so like I said during the game that would occur from something like d4, d5, c4, e6, takes, takes. It's the exact same position as this. Um, so I assume many of the same things apply. I don't know them. <laughs> like I don't play D4, so I or, or C4. Uh, well, I did start playing that recently, actually. But I don't play one D4, so I don't know any of the theory or anything like that. But I just play natural Karo Khan moves. Knight F3. We have Knight C6, which the computer does say is a bit in the wrong direction, because. The knight shouldn't really be blocking the c pawn like this. More natural would be to play a move like knight f6, knight c3, maybe bishop d6, bishop g5, and c6. The computer thinks this setup is quite nice for the black pieces, and the game is just dead equal. Like, and it's kind of what you'd expect, right? We have an exchange structure, so neither of us have like really pushed for a big advantage. My opponent traded off his e pawn early. We both, you know, I have good control over e5. My opponent has good control over e4. I have the dark squares. He has the light squares. And we're just going to battle it out. Both of our kings are safe. And it's just going to be chess. Because his center is nicely supported. My knight can't get in or anything like that. Knight c6 is a bit wrong, though. Because he's challenging me on the dark squares in the center. But I own the dark squares. And he doesn't even have an e pawn to put on e5 to really challenge me. If he could play something like bishop d6 e5 to go after my dark squared monopoly, yeah, sure, that makes sense. But he doesn't, he doesn't have an e pawn. Or if he tried to do something like c5, okay, apparently this isn't a good move because of bishop g, bishop g5. But the point is, this would be another valid pawn break, not necessarily in this position, but at some point, right, to challenge my dark squares. The problem with knight c6 is not only does, his, does he block his pawn from going to c6, he also blocks the move c5, which might have been an idea later on in the game to challenge my dark squares, but he's just going at it with a knight, and the knight is just facing off against this pawn, which essentially controls it. So, you know, you can say that I'm going a bit too in-depth on that, and it's not even that big of a concession from black, and you'd kind of be correct, but at the same time, if black makes men like move after move where he's just slightly misplacing a piece and then all of his pieces end up slightly misplaced, then you start to get losing positions. You can get away with it with one piece, maybe two pieces, but too many pieces and it's going to become a problem. And, you know, even though he only really misplaced one piece, we did kind of get to take advantage of it later in the game because that's where the tactics came from against this knight that was misplaced on the c6 square. So it's quite interesting, right? 
So I go knight c3, and there's, there's nothing special. I'm just developing. The key difference between his knight on c6 and my knight on c3, though, is I don't have a c pawn, right? I know I just criticized his knight for being misplaced, and you might be saying, oh, I'm challenging the light squares. Why am I doing that? There's two differences. One, I'm not blocking a C pawn from moving. So my knight isn't in the way. And two, I actually have the ability to go E4 to challenge him in the light squares at some point in the game. My opponent doesn't have that ability. So you can see how the minute difference in pawn structure really does affect the plans of the position. Because knight C3 for me is a perfectly natural move. Knight C6 for him is not. Knight F6. Obviously, knight f6 is a different story. That's just a good move. Bishop g5 looked like the most natural developing move for me. Computer agrees. We have bishop e7, e3. These are just, you know, normal moves. Queen c2 is fine. I'm sure a3 is also a fine move. My opponent goes a6. I go a3. Not the most accurate, but there's no point spending loads and loads of time finding the best moves in this position. At the end of the day, I'm just trying to dominate the dark squares, and that's what I'm doing. Bishop g4, we go h3, bishop h5, and apparently the advantage is growing. And the computer really likes g4. g4, bishop g6 is... what's the idea? Bishop f6, bishop f6, queen... Oh, this is just a double attack. I feel like I've missed this kind of thing in a previous game, where, like my opponent abandons the defense of his pawn on b7 or b2 the knight comes out to c3 or c6 to block his c pawn from coming to c6 and defending d5 and then i have the choice to take a knight on f6 or f3 to destabilize the center and that's kind of what happens here because his bishop is all the way in no man's land on g6 looking at nothing and he's he can't defend himself properly Knight a5 is the best move. Queen d5, queen d5, knight d5. Bishop e4, knight f6, gf6. This isn't even that good for white. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's not even that good. So maybe, maybe it's fine that I didn't see this. Well, no, it's fine that I didn't play it, but I should have seen it. I should have seen it, but... This, again, is the point of this series, because these ideas, I guarantee, will exist in some of your Karo Khan games when you play them. I mean, maybe one in a hundred, sure, because you first have to get the criteria of going into an exchange variation, then your opponent needs to misplace their knight, then they need to bring their bishop out to pin your knight. Like, there's a lot of criteria, but opening ideas tend to be fairly consistent, especially as you start getting, I'd say, above like 1,200 maybe 1400, people start to understand the general themes of openings. And although my opponent misplayed this game in the opening and early middle game, he understood where a lot of his pieces should be going. Like this is this sort of piece set up with his, this bishop, this knight, and this bishop is pretty typical. And that would be fine if his pawn was on c6 rather than the knight being on c6. Because if this pawn was on c6, the knight was on d7, this would be fine because d5 would be well protected and b7 wouldn't be that big of an issue. You could just play a move like queen c7 or rook b8. But yeah, I miss an opportunity by going g4 and you can change the move order up with bishop to f6, but bishop e2 is a fine move. It doesn't, it doesn't take advantage of my opponent's misplay. By the way, you can mix up the move order again with uh, queen b3 which is a bit less forcing, but also completely viable. But um, yeah, bishop e2, it's not the best move, but it's not a bad move. My opponent goes queen d6. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. So knight to e4 was the best move, just offering lots of trades. And after something like bishop e7, knight e7 is the only move. Oh, because d5 would hang. So, and obviously you don't want to take with the king because then you can't castle. Something like knight e7, queen b3. Mm, it, this is okay for black, but it's just comfortable for white. Again, the computer really wants to play this move c6. Like, it really wants to do that because that's where the pawn belongs. So, 
take note for a lot of your positions c6 when there's a pawn on d5 that tends to be where the pawn wants to go but um yeah he didn't go for this he went queen d6 and the best way to capitalize on this was queen b3 or bishop f4 which Huh. It does actually like rook c1. It likes it more than bishop f4, but queen b3 is apparently a bit more accurate. I guess the whole idea of just exposing the d5 and b7 pawns. Castle queenside looks natural because you defend b7 and add another defender to d5. But like I said during the game, I would love for my opponent to castle queenside because I have full confidence that I could take advantage of it with moves like rook c1. Maybe move my queen out of the way, b4, b5. I don't believe my opponent can defend this. I go rook c1. Again, perfectly valid move. And if my opponent castles queen side, he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Knight e5 apparently wins on the spot. This should be 2, knight e2. Yeah, the computer thinks this is completely winning. Ah, because of the alignment of the rook and the bishop on c7. So if my opponent tries to do something like this, He's going to die. Like, he will just lose. This is, you know, game over. He's going to get windmilled somehow. Or just queen b3, threatening mate. He goes h6. So I, I go rook c1. Um, because I noticed the weakness of the c7 pawn. Did I see that variation I just played out? Absolutely not. But I noticed the knight is misplaced. The pawn is therefore misplaced. There could be something on the c file. And if I put my bishop on f4, it would be quite nice. So my opponent goes h6. Again, I should have taken on f6 and just gone queen b3 and just won a pawn. I don't know why I had like a blind spot to this. Um, I just had a complete blind spot. I don't know why. I think my mind was obsessed with keeping my queen on d1 to defend my bishop on e2. So that if I moved the knight, I could always take back with the queen. I think that's why I didn't consider this. But it's interesting because I'm sure quite a lot of you would have seen this like pretty quickly. But sometimes your mind just blanks on something for, you know, many, many moves in a row because it's just got it subconsciously. No, 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 my queen is on d1. Like this is where the queen goes because I need to defend the bishop. So my knight can move freely and I don't have to take the bishop back with the king if he takes. You know, it, it's interesting, right? But anyway, bishop f4. We attack the queen, and the queen, like I said, has three squares to go to. He chooses d7. It's fine. If he goes to e6, I probably just take. Yeah, I think that's the simplest. d8 obviously just completely undevelops. Apparently, it is the best move, though. I think queen d7 is more natural because you just keep everything defended, you step out of the way, and you also keep the queen out so that the rooks stay connected because queen d8 is a tough move to play just putting the queen back on her home square a castle this is fine g4 is apparently good and then castling but i don't see the need to allow that that looks a little bit scary so we just castle my opponent castles again queen b3 is a good move g4 is a good move but i think i actually considered g4 yeah, I'm sure I considered g4 in the game, but for some reason I didn't like it. I I knew that his sacrifices didn't work, but I don't know, something about, something about it felt a little bit off to me. Yeah, you do have to be accurate. You've got to take with the pawn, then like knight e4. Oh, d5 hangs. Ah, d5 hangs. That's the idea. Because you force the knight away from the defense and you open up the d file. Okay, okay, I think um, I think a big lesson from this game, a big lesson, is in these positions, in these Caro positions, the exchange Caro, I mean it's also a Queen's Gambit declined position as well, when the knight misplaces itself in front of the C-pawn, the C-pawn is supposed to protect the D-pawn, if you can try and undermine the defense of the D-pawn by doing something to this knight then there's always ideas of forking the d pawn and the b pawn once the bishop develops or obviously from the other side when the bishop comes out to g5 and leaves the defense of b2 so it's a good lesson for myself and i think this is a really useful way to actually utilize computer analysis 
by figuring out like why it has the why, why it's plus 1.2 like why is that the case because there's just weaknesses on b7 and d5 and i didn't notice this during the game but hopefully i do for future games now that i've delved into this a bit deeper and hopefully you guys also notice this in some of your games by the way if you've made it this far in the video and you're not subscribed to the channel bro you are literally 40 minutes in you're enjoying this content i assume unless you've just got me on as, as like a podcast or something which by the way if you have me on as like a podcast no hate whatsoever um i'd be really interested to know like if that's what you do like you don't even watch the game you just listen to me talk that would be that'd be quite interesting i feel like maybe two percent of you do that but hey let me know um but yeah if you're not subscribed bro subscribe get my videos recommended to you more often help me help you improve at chess anyway here so like i said g4 is the idea knight e5 is also good queen b3 is good rookie one is also a move i mentioned that is good yeah i should have gone knight e5 but i went knight a4 i went knight a4 and my idea was to just whack the knight on c5 and I was expecting maybe something like bishop d6, which is what my opponent did. And I think in my head, I thought I could do something like this and put the knight on c5, which is completely valid. And my opponent apparently has to just play rook a b8, which is very, very passive. And then I can just continue adding pressure. After bishop d6, I chose knight e5, which, which is a fine move. That is a completely fine move. And there's only one move for my opponent to maintain the advantage. And there is... Sorry, not maintain the advantage. To not let me win. There is one move. And there is absolutely no way you find it. I mean, no. There's not absolutely no way you find it. But I would encourage you to try and find it. Because this is really interesting. So, yeah, pause the video here. Try and find the move. I think once you find it, you'll know you found it, but you have to calculate it out. So I'll give you a second to do that. Move is knight e5, which looks impossible because de5 comes with a fork. But the point is that the queen is overloaded and the knight taking reveals the queen's attack on a4. So you can now play bishop e2. I have to take queen a4, EF6, Bishop F4. This is the only line for black. Only line. And apparently black is better unless I find Queen G4 pinning the bishop to the queen. Black then needs to play another very accurate move. This is crazy. <laughs> this is a really interesting line. He needs to find Bishop H2 check. King takes. Queen takes. Pawn takes. And he can't take this, otherwise I'll take. So he has to play rook a c8. Fg7. King g7, rook fd1. And white maintains a slight advantage because his rooks are more active. And my opponent's pawn structure is a little bit worse than mine with the split pawns here. That sequence is eight moves long. And very difficult to calculate, especially moves like Queen G4, Bishop H2. So realistically, we posed a very hard question to my opponent here. And he took on E2. He took on E2. And Knight D7 is the only move for White to maintain his advantage. The problem is, if Queen E2, my opponent has this move, Knight D4. Ah, so the problem is, I've relinquished my defense of the knight. My queen no longer defends d4. So after this desperado, if I take and queen a4, my opponent's just up a pawn. And he probably has some nice pressure on the e file as well. He'd probably play like c6 and solve all of his problems. d4 is weak. Something like rook fd1. You could even play something simple like c6 probably. Or not. <laughs> or not. But rook a8. It's a nice position for the black pieces. He's just up a clean pawn. But we take on d7. We find the best move. Of course, my opponent has to take my queen because I just took his queen. So we're down a piece currently. Knight f6 is the move. 
because it comes with check and it gets rid of this knight that's under attack. So knight f6, g f6. And yeah, my problem was if bishop d6, bishop a4, bishop f8, rook f8, or king f8, and yeah, it's just two pieces for a rook. And you can argue his pawn structure is damaged. And did I win a did I win any pawns? No. Is it's equal pawns. So I have no actual pressure. My opponent doesn't really have many weaknesses apart from over here. But because of the nature of rooks, it's very hard to access those squares because of there's so many closed files. So rook takes d1 is the best move. And specifically rook f takes. Because I know he's going to take my bishop. So I want my rook to support the d-pawn. And I want to keep my rook on the c-file. Because like I said, that's where the action is. Because c7 is weak and the knight is potentially weak. So bishop f4, which also is the only move for black not to just lose. Because let's say black... I don't even know what he can play here, actually. Rook fd8 is the second best move. But then I just win h6. And if you do something like king g7, then I'm just going to take and ruin your structure. And the game is completely over. Black has nothing. So, he, I mean, taking is the most natural move anyway. He takes, I take back. Rook f2 e8. And here, I thought I needed to be quite accurate. King f1 is playable. Rook c5 is also a move, which I briefly considered, but I thought he just put his rook on d8, and I don't see the point. I want to put my knight on c5, not my rook. So, yeah, I found knight c5, which, yeah, I would say is the best move, really. The computer gives it a toss-up between rook c5 and knight c5. And to be fair to my opponent... He finds the best move, rook a7, as passive as it looks. The problem is he needs to defend the b7 pawn. If he tries to play a move like b6, I mean, I can just win a pawn like this for a start. But um, even if I don't win the pawn, let's say I play a move like, I don't know, knight b3 even, this is still a problem. Rook e6 defending... I have f5, rook d6. He's getting incredibly cramped. I can maybe double up on the c file. Black, Black's position is horrible. Absolutely horrible because of all the weaknesses on the queen side. But of course, knight takes a6 is just way cleaner. So he, he goes rook a7. And rook b8 doesn't really work. Because not only can I go knight d7 with a fork. And then I'm going to pick up b pawn maybe. If rook bd8, knight f6, oh, I just picked this rook up anyway. What am I on about? So, yeah, fair play to my opponent. He plays um, rook a7. Also, there is maybe knight a6, but the problem is he gets his rooks in, and I didn't like this. So, rook a7. And here, I did not take on b7 because of the same idea. Rook c6, rook b2. And I didn't like that after rook a6, rook e2... It, maybe I'm better, but like, this is horrible. This rook is going to be tied down to the defense of my king, and I don't think I can actually win this game, and the computer agrees with me. So I mean like, rook f1, rook ed2, if I go rook a4, the, the game is basically over, as in no one can move. Because he needs to keep pressure on the f file, he needs to keep pressure on d4, he can play a move like rook a1 to put pressure on a3. But nobody is moving anytime soon. I'd say black has more winning chances, to be honest, because of how active his rooks are compared to mine stuck defending pawns. So we go king f1. f5 was apparently a bit better. I think it's just taking space and locking the f pawn in as a weakness. But I like the move king f1 because we just stop any rookie two ideas, which I think is quite important. My opponent goes king g7. Which is a fine move. We go b4. I'm just going to let the computer think a second here. Because it's kind of changing its mind. It thinks b6 is the best move. Because I can no longer do this. Because a3 will hang. Whereas previously it wasn't hanging. Knight a4 is the best. Knight e7. Rook d3. Rook e1. Rook e1 looks nice. And yeah... <sighs> This looks so uncomfortable for the black pieces. Maybe he can get a draw here. But like, look at his rooks. 
Like, they are horrible pieces. H5 is the best move. Like, who's playing H5? C6? I can just take it, though. Knight C6, rookie 8, knight D4, knight B6, black's completely lost. So, he can't take on D4. He has to find A5, or it's over. I mean, seriously. We could even... Can we go B5? Maybe not. Oh, because um, he'll just come back and take. But, yeah, incredibly difficult position. We go B4, my opponent goes rookie 7, and here he loses the game because of knight B7. And now it works, because not only have I stopped rookie 2, but I've also stopped rook B2 if he takes. If my opponent does take, then I just take on C6, rook B2 followed by rook E2 doesn't exist. He also doesn't have rook E2 first because my king controls that square. And my opponent has nothing, really. We're attacking everything on the 6th rank. So he probably has to try and defend it with a move like rook b6. I mean, I can trade, but I feel like this gives him some more chances. I think far cleaner is a move like rook c5. Stopping a5, attacking d5, keeping pressure on c7. My rook is an amazing piece. I might double up on the c-file. This is essentially game over in my book. So knight b7, great move. My opponent tries knight b4. And to be fair, if I take it, he's probably good. Yeah, it's just equal. Because I lose my advantage entirely. After knight b4, I did consider the move knight d8. But the issue is that he can get out of knight c6 problems with an attack on my knight with either rook e8 or rook a8. So c6 is no longer a forking square, and he can move one of his rooks out of the way with an attack on my knight, so it comes with tempo. So something like rook e8 and, I take, and he takes. I'm slightly better, but he's okay. So that is why knight a5 is the move, because he can't attack the knight, and his knight has to move, and his knight doesn't have squares. The only square is a2, and then just rook c2, and he can't defend the knight. The knight is completely dead. And this is still a threat. And this is kind of what happened in the game. He goes c5, which is a valiant effort. I did consider dc5 because I was like, the knight still has no escape. Knight a2, rook c2, the knight still has no way out. But why complicate things? Let's just take it and then fork him, win a rook, and then we're just going to go and win his pawns. Rook a7 is the only move to defend the a pawn. And then I just go rook bd1. Sorry, rook d b1. And the issue is that he can't defend his pawns. He just can't. If he plays a move like king g6, I just take on b4. If he takes, I take his rook. I go from behind, win the pawn. And obviously, this is completely winning. So yeah, this is a pretty long analysis, but I hope it was useful. For those of you who made it to the end of the video, thank you very much for watching. And I will see you guys in the next one.